labrīt, dāmas un kungi. Ļoti priecājos sveikt jūs tik kuplā skaitā šajā pasākumā, šajā vasaras skolā, kurā ir veltīta startautiskām Eiropas tiesībām. Tas ir brīnišķi nosaukts arī par šī brīža izaicinājumiem. Un es teiktu, ka ir ļoti ērti, ja tā varētu teikt, uzsākt šo te vasaras skolu, ņemot vērā salīdzinoši nesenos polijas konstālās tiesas lēmumus, kas ir aktualizējuši druski jautājumi par to, kas tad ir svarīgāks Eiropas vai nacionālās tiesības. Raugoties to manas kādu punktu, tur ir ne tikai tiesības, bet arī droši vien bišķi arī politika klāt. Bet es nešaubos, ka šādi vai līdzīgi izaicinājumi vai problēmas būs ik gadu, un tāpēc es arī ļoti ceru, ka ar šo mēs uzsākam jaunu tradīciju, Rīgas judiskās augstskolas vasaras skolu, un kas ir ļoti patīkami, tad šīs skolas iniciātori, idejas autori, ir arī profesori Ineta Ziemeli. Bet kopā ar viņu šīs skolas, ja tā varētu teikt, saturu veidoja arī citi jurdiskās augstskolas mācības spēki, arī citi profesionāļi no Latvijas un arī profesionāļi no ļoti nozīmīgām institūcijām. Es šeit nevēlos varbūt viņus pilnīgi visus uzskaitīt vasaras skolas programmā. Tie ir redzami. Katrā gadījumā es patiešām esmu gandarīts, ka šī vasaras skola ir radus tik plašu atsaucību gan no tiesnešu vidus, gan no arī valsts pārvaldes vidus, no pasniedzēja puses, arī dzene no studentiem. Un es ļoti ceru, ka tas laiks, ko jūs varbūt neveltīsiet tur, saulei un jūrai, būs vismaz tikpat piepildīts un gandarījiem dodoši, ja ne vēl vairāk. Katrā gadījumā domāju, ka tas intelektuālais gandarījums no šī būs daudz paliekošāks par to iedegumu, ko jūs varbūt veselībai nekaitējot dabūtu, bet es negribu šeit aizņemt ārkārtīgi ilgu laiku. Es ar šo noslēdzu savu uzrunu un ar prieku dodu vārdu tātad šīs vasaras skolas iniciātorei, profesorei Intai Ziemelei. Tūdzu, profesor. Jā, paldies. Labrīt, paldies profesoram Ikstāna kungam. Paldies arī Rīgas jurdiskajā augstskolai par to, ka patiesībā ideja, kas ir briedusi diezgan ilgi un diezgan sen ar augstskolas un ar kolēģu citu Eiropas tiesu, tiesnešu un arī juridiskās augstskolas mācības pēku un administrācijas palīdzību, Beidzot, mēs kopīgiem spēkajiem šo ideju par vasaras skolu starptautiskajās un Eiropas tiesībās šajā nedēļā varēsim īstenot. Un es pie saviem domāju, nu, kāpēc tieši šajā laikā, jo patiesībā tā doma vismaz man, ka šāda vasaras skola ar šīm tēmām ir vajadzīga, man viņa ir, nu, kā minimums 15 gadus, ja nevēl ilgāk. Tas, ka 
šī skola tiek piedāvāta jums šogad, varbūt arī norāda uz to, ka varbūt tas ugons dzēšanas režīms kādā Latvija sevi veidotas kā modernu valsts, varbūt tās mazlietiņi ir, ir, ir pamainījies, iespējams arī Covid pandēmija tajā ir ienesusi savu sudraba maliņu, jo šādā veidā iespējams, ka mums ir vieglāk arī satikties un kopā noskaidrot, kas tad ir noticis Eiropas un pasaules procesos. Nu, katrā ziņā pasaule ir pamainījusies. Un varbūt arī tāpēc ir šis brīdis vasaras skolai katrā ziņā. Es visiem interesētiem, kas pieteicās un kas ir gatavi nedēļu intensīvi strādāt, es esmu ļoti pateicīgi par to, ka jūs man ļaujat ar jums kopā šo ideju īstenot. Otrais moments ir tas, ka Latvija nešaubīgi ir daļa no Eiropas. Latvijai ir savs vārds sakāms arī Eiropas procesos. Latvija to ir mācījusies darīt un ir skaidrs, ka Latvijas politiskos lēmumus juridiskā terminoloģijā ietērpj liela daļa no jums. Vai jūs strādāja valsts pārvaldē, vai pēc tam tiesu varā vakatūras pusē skatāt, vai šie lēmumi bija pareizi pēc būtības un arī pēc vārda, vai viņi ir pareizi iekārti. Līdz ar to um, ir, ir absolūti nepieciešams um, apskatīties, kur tad um, mēs esam šajos Eiropas procesos un um, kur ir šie paši Eiropas procesi, notiesiskā skatu punkta. Bet uh, ne par velti mēs šodien sāksim ar um, startautiskajām tiesībām, tādēļ no globālā iesimus konkrēto, atbilstoši vasaras skolas programmai, jo, protams, ka bāze, arī Eiropas tiesībām ir vēsturiski izveidojušās ļoti ilgu gadsimtu rezultātā izveidojušās starptautiskās tiesības. Un līdz ar to man likās, ka konceptuāli ir pareizi sākt tātad no tā, no kurienes Eiropas tiesības ir izaugušas, un tad jau iet detaļās iekšā Eiropas tiesību aktualitātēs. Un tad ir trešais punkts, kāpēc šī vasaras skola vairs nevarēja gaidīt, viņa bija jālaiž tautās. Un kā profesors Ekstens minēja, es arī ceru, ka tas kļūs par Latvijas tiesiskajām politiskajā domā nepieciešanu tradīciju. Un trešais iemesls ir tāds, ka pēdējā laikā vismaz šī, šajā pagājušajā ziemā, kas bija pietiekami komplicēta, ne tikai, ne tikai sanitāru iemeslu dēļ, bet arī konceptuālu iemeslu dēļ ir ļoti daudz izskanējuši mīti par to, kas ir un kas nav Eiropas tiesības, kādas ir Eiropas vērtības un kādas nav Eiropas vērtības, un līdz ar to arī Latvijas vērtības, Protams, un vienīgais veids, kā, kā kritiski analizēt šos mītus, ir vienkārši pašiem pagātinātās ar zināšanām un eventuāli arī šos mītus atspēkot. Nu, lūk, un tāda ir visa šī idejiskā bāze, ja tā varētu teikt, iemeslam, kāpēc mēs šajā nedēļā noturēsim šo vasaras skolu, un es teiktu, es ļoti gribu cerēt, ka tā būs nopietni pievienotā vērtība jums konkrēti jūsu darbos, bet arī plašākā izpratnē. Tā, ar šo es līdz ar to saku paldies par to, ka mēs esam spējuši tātad šodien atklāt vasaras skolu. Es, protams, arī atgriezīšos piekdienā paskatīšos, kāda mums ir kopējā temperatūra, bet jau iepriekš es gribu pateikt paldies arī pasniedzējiem, kas katru dienu ar jums strādās un visam jūtiskās augstkopas atbalstošajam personālam. Tā, nu tad mēs varam sākt un 
man ir tas gods uh, informēt, zināmā mērā arī, tā varētu teikt, attālināt, kas naudīgi priekšā, um, Eiropas Savienības tiesas priekšsēdētāju, profesoru Kūnu Lēnārcu, kurš uh, piekrita uh, ar mielu un tādu entuziāsmu Piedalīties mūsu vasaras skolā arī novērtējot šīs idejas svarību un, un ne tikai jau pieminēto notikumu dēļ nu, dažādās Eiropas Savienības dalībvalstīs. Un līdz ar to prezidents Leinarts ierakstīja savu lekciju jau savu laicību, bet pašreiz tiesas ir pauzē Eiropas Savienības tiesas. Um, un mums ir tā iespēja jums piedāvāt tādu šo uh, profesoru Leinārtsa um, lekcijas ierakstu, un līdz ar to es nodoru tādu uh, stafeti uh, tehniskajiem cilvēkiem, lai varētu šo lekciju mums uh, tagad uh, piedāvāt noplausīties. Un es tik tiešām teiktu, tas viens no uh, organizatoriskajiem jautājumiem, um, tad, kad es apgriezīšos pēc prezidenta Leinārta uh, lekcijas, un mēs sāksim ar starptautiskajām tiesībām, es pirmais, ko es aicināšu, es gribēju šī jūs redzēt un lai video paliek ieslēgt, lai jūs ir tāda sajūta, ka es strādāju ar auditoriju, un mēs arī strādāsim uh, interaktīvi, tāpēc es gribēšu gan jūsu rociņus redzēt, gan reakcijas, uh, smaidus, sviedrus no tā, cik liels materiāls ir, tāpēc ir tik liels starptautiskajās tiesībās, to es jums pastāstīšu tad, kad atkal man būs vārds, bet uh, tagad, protams, vārds uh, prezidentam līdz. George Zimile, fellow judges, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, I first of all want to express my thanks to Judge Zimile, my dear colleague, Ineta Zimile, for having invited me to give this guest lecture at the summer school of the Riga Graduate School of Law. The lecture is devoted to analyzing the EU legal order, a legal order common to 27 member states. And when I say that the EU legal order is a legal order common to 27 member states, it first of all refers to the fact that EU law is not foreign law, but rather, by its very nature, it is the law of the land in each member state. EU law is Latvian law, just as it is Spanish law, Irish law, Greek law, and so on, 27 times. EU law and national law are part of the same legal system, which is the system of law valid in each state, each member state. Now, we designate EU law and the EU legal order as an autonomous legal order. And what does that mean, this idea of an autonomous legal order? It very simply means that EU law is in the end based on the treaties and every rule of law in the European Union must be valid in terms of its compliance, its compatibility with the treaties on which EU law is based. These treaties are the Treaty on European Union, the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, and very importantly, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. All rules of Union law which comply with these treaties and with the Charter of Fundamental Rights enjoy the primacy over domestic laws of the member states. And this is quite normal. The member states have, all 27, concluded a treaty. Through these treaties, the member states created a new legal person of international law, being the European Union. 
and conferred on this uh, European Union uh, competences to deal with policy areas which by their very nature are of the common interest of all these 27 member states taken collectively. So the member states have made these treaties with one another, creating thereby a common legal person being the European Union. The European Union adopts legislative acts and executive acts, which are thereafter valid in the member states and take primacy over the domestic laws of the member states. Most of these rules, like the treaty rules, the charter rules, but also rules contained in, uh, the, in regulations and directives, uh, produce direct effect in the national legal systems. Direct effect means that uh, all interested parties, and in particular individuals, be, whether they be natural or legal persons, can directly invoke and rely on uh, these rules contained in union law before the national courts. The individuals are really center stage for the application and enforcement in their favor of the rules of union law granting rights to these individuals. And this can occur in all the subject matters covered by European Union law, whether it be consumer protection, tax law, where the individuals, let's say businesses, can derive the right to tax deduction, I'm thinking of the value added tax uh, regime, and so on. So in the several areas of union law, individuals derive rights from union law which they can directly invoke in the national courts in order to see these national courts enforce these rights. In that sense, the courts of general jurisdiction of European Union law, that is the courts applying and enforcing respect for union law, are the national courts. The court of justice of the European Union of which my outstanding colleague Ineta Zimele and myself are members, that is only a court with specific competences conferred by the member states in the treaties on that court. For instance, the competence to uniformly interpret union law, but that competence is in fact a very specific conferred competence which does not come in the place of the competence or jurisdiction of the national courts, which are, as I said, the courts of general jurisdiction for applying and enforcing union law in litigation between private parties, or between, on the one hand, a private party, and on the other hand, a public party. It's very simple. All litigation pending between private parties, let's say the enforcement of a contract where the question arises whether the contract is uh, complying with the European Union law directives on consumer protection. This is contract law for performance of the contract. All these cases, they are pending in the national courts. All these actions are brought in the national courts. Or else a contractual litigation which turns on compliance or not of the contract with the EU rules on competition. Here again, such cases are pending in the national courts because such actions are brought in the national courts. So you see, the mainstream application of European Union law and its enforcement are the general jurisdiction of the national courts, not the court of justice. This is an idea of subsidiarity. The private parties suing other private parties in litigation whose outcome depends 
on the correct application and enforcement of the rule of union law, they must bring their case in the national courts. The same applies when a private party brings a case against a public party, it will always be before the national courts. Such cases may involve tax law or may involve administrative law. Think about a business which applies for an authorization to extend the, um, the site of the business uh, in a given city and uh, that authorization is being refused because um, it is said to be incompatible with um, rules of union law on protection of the environment. The undertaking may say no, these rules have been wrongly relied on by the administration and may bring the case before the National Administrative Court to have um, that court see uh, the uh, review better, the legality of that administrative decision and possibly order the annulment of that decision. Also, criminal law cases, when the prosecutor uh, prosecutes uh, a person, the person may say that the national law which it allegedly has breached is in fact in contradiction with uh, union law. In all those settings, whether it be in litigation between private parties or between, on the one hand, a private party, on the other hand, a public party, the national courts will have to interpret union law in order to correctly apply it and to enforce its respect in that uh, particular litigational setting. Whenever the national courts uh, have a doubt on the interpretation uh, of um, union law, they're always entitled, they always have the right to refer the question of interpretation of union law to the court of justice. The court sitting in last instance, they have the obligation to refer to the court of justice for the very simple reason that the court of last instance, the Supreme Court, let's say, of a member state, it has the highest authority in the judicial hierarchy of the member state. And it is extremely important that the jurisprudence developed by the Supreme Courts be absolutely in compliance with the uniform interpretation of union law. The uniform interpretation of union law can only be given, that's one of these conferred competences on the Court of Justice of the European Union, the uniform interpretation can only be given by the Court of Justice of the European Union. National courts, not sitting in last instance, may, without referring to the Court of Justice, interpret themselves. The idea being, they may refer to the Court of Justice, but they are not obliged to do so. Why? Because if they get it wrong, there is always an appeal possible to the higher court, and in the end, the highest court is obliged to refer the question to the Court of Justice, and the Court of Justice will make a uniform interpretation. When I say uniform interpretation, it means that the interpretation given by the Court of Justice upon request of a judge of a particular member state, the interpretation given by the Court of Justice will be valid for all 27 member states. The logic being very simply, and that's the logic of the treaties themselves concluded by the member states among themselves, treaties in which they created the European Union and the Court of Justice of the European Union, the idea is that the rules which the member states have in common, that is European Union law rules, that they must remain common, not only at the level of the law on the books, but also at the level of the law as applied. So when the Court of Justice is being seized of a reference for a preliminary ruling, the first thing which will happen is that the ruling is being translated towards the 23 other official languages. The ruling by which the National Court refers to the Court of Justice, that is a National Court ruling, 
is therefore available in all union languages. It will be notified to all 27 member states. All 27 member states may come in before the Court of Justice in order to have the court being informed from the possible consequences of different possible interpretations of this union law rule submitted to the Court of Justice for interpretation and therefore the national legal orders must be heard. That is done through the participation of the member states in the procedure before the Court of Justice. Moreover, the Court of Justice counts, as we all know, one judge per member state. The idea there also is that all the judges can bring in their respective legal background as well as their cultural background, their sociological background, that is the background in all respects of the diversity of approaches in different member states. So it's very important that this uh, plurality of legal approaches, of political, social, economic, cultural, ethical approaches, the plurality is brought in the internal reflection and the internal workings of our court. And this is operated by all these national judges from all 27 member states, submitting preliminary references on interpretation of union law rules to the Court of Justice, all these references being translated into 24 official languages, notified to all of the 27 member states, these member states bring in their views on what the common uniform interpretation should be, and with, a, with regard to all these submissions made to the Court of Justice, the Court comes to a collegiate judgment which makes, hopefully, a smart combination of all the different sensitivities to make the rules common to 27 member states, that is the rules of union law, work as real common rules for all 27 member states. That is the essential task of the Court of Justice. Now the Court does so with utmost respect for legal diversity in the member states. The Court also draws on the constitutional traditions common to the member states. The member states explain us their legal systems and first and foremost their constitutional systems. For the Court of Justice it is really a challenge to operationalize the motto of the European Union in diversity united. So it always comes to balancing the specifics of the national identity of a particular member state with the common character of the constitutional traditions of all 27 member states. That is being done through several methods of interpretation of union law and as I have been informed, Judge Zimmele will draw in particular on those several methods, so I am not going into those any further at this stage. Next to the interpretation of union law, as I already said, the court has as task to control the validity of the acts adopted by the union institutions, such as legislative acts, can be in the form of regulations, directives or decisions, or executive acts. So all these acts must be in conformity with the higher rules of the union legal order itself. That is why, as I said at the beginning, uh, the union legal order is said to be autonomous, meaning it is self-referential. The validity of the acts of union institutions is only to be assessed in the light of the higher rules of the union legal order itself, being the treaties and the charter of fundamental rights. Now you will have understood that the cooperation 
between the national courts being the courts of general jurisdiction of union law on the one hand and the court of justice of the European Union on the other hand being the court of uniform interpretation of union law and of validity control of the acts of the union institutions that cooperation is formatted through the reference for preliminary ruling procedure. That procedure is a procedure which has, has to be seen in a horizontal way. That is a dialogue between national courts and the court of justice as equal partners, each one playing its own role. The initial interpretation of union law will always be given by the national court referring a question for preliminary ruling to the court of justice. The court of justice will then reply to the national court with an interpretation which will thereafter be valid uniformly in all 27 member states. But the role of the national courts, again as courts of general jurisdiction of union law, is crucial. Because without the national courts discovering the issues of union law arising in the case and hence making an initial interpretation of these rules so as to designate them as potentially applicable in the case, is essential for the court of justice to have a debate potentially involving all the member states and the parties in the main action pending in the national court and thereafter, on the basis of that, die of that debate, come to a final decision. In other words, without qualitative references for a preliminary ruling stemming from the national courts, the Court of Justice cannot properly do its job. That is why the national courts need to be independent, impartial, and need to operate in compliance with fair trial rules. All of that being contained in Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. Because the whole area of freedom, security, and justice, that is the judicial cooperation in civil matters, judicial cooperation in criminal matters, these aspects of judicial cooperation between national courts inside the European Union as one single space without internal frontiers, that is the Schengen space, can only work when national courts trust one another among themselves, when Latvian courts trust Belgian courts, when Belgian courts trust Polish courts, when Polish courts trust Latvian courts, and that in all directions inside the uh, big area without internal frontiers constituting the present European Union. So that is why the Court of Justice uh, recently has developed a whole case law um, spelling out the requirements uh, for, of respect for the rule of law, uh, the rule of law guaranteed by independent and impartial courts in the member states, because these national courts fulfill the role of making European Union law work in the national legal system. And not just from a perspective of primacy and direct effect of Union law as integral part of the national legal system of the member state concerned, but also when the national courts uh, deliver judgments which thereafter have to be recognized in another member state of the European Union and possibly even be enforced there. Think about the Brussels 1 and the Brussels 2 regulations in the matter of judicial cooperation in civil law matters, um, but also in criminal matters. Think about the European arrest warrant. The European arrest warrant being a judicial decision of one member state which has to be enforced uh, by the judicial system of another member state. So that is why mutual trust mutual recognition between the judiciaries of all 27 member states, the cooperation of national courts on the one hand and the Court of Justice of the European Union on the other hand, 
all of this judicial organizational fabric is premised on the condition that all the courts involved are independent, impartial, and operate in accordance with fair trial rules. The decisions of the Court of Justice of the European Union are binding as such in all of the member states. And this is very understandable. It is a law common to the member states. The Court of Justice of the European Union was created by the member states, established by the member states in the treaties which they concluded among themselves, all 27 of them, in order to have a neutral umpire for saying the law common to all these member states. It is clear that if a national court were authorized, which it is not, to be very clear, but if it were hypothetically authorized to break away from a uniform interpretation given by the Court of Justice of the European Union, this would indeed destroy the common character of the rule of union law being interpreted in the preliminary ruling. That is why the preliminary rulings of the Court of Justice, all of them, are translated to all 24 official languages of the European Union. Even the most technical, at first sight, limited scope or limited importance cases, once it is a reference for a preliminary ruling, which led to the interpretation by the Court of Justice of a rule of the Union law, these rulings are all without exception translated into the 24 official languages of the European Union, which allows these rulings, these interpretations if you prefer, to become the law of the land uh, in all 27 member states without exception. Latvian courts have, on the day of yesterday, 8th of July 2021, when I made my latest check, referred 102 uh, times for a preliminary ruling. The first reference ever from Latvia was um, made on the 15th of January 2008. So just under four years after accession. And it concerned a rather technical matter of tariff classification of certain active matrix liquid crystal devices. Now, it shows you how real life of European Union law works. The company Schenker, a German company, was fined by the Latvian customs authorities for having wrongly classified certain active matrix liquid crystal devices in its customs declaration, and thus having wrongly applied to them a rate of import duty of 0%. In the view of the customs authorities, those devices should have been considered as finished articles, namely video monitors. Since even if they were incomplete or unfinished, they already had the essential character of the complete article. So the customs authorities applied an import duty rate of 14%. However, Schenker attacks this decision before the Latvian Administrative Court of Appeal and the Court of Justice found in answering the reference for a preliminary ruling by the Latvian Administrative Court of Appeal that the devices at issue could not be classified as finished video monitors. So that goes in the direction of the company against the um, tax administration. It must be said that the Latvian Administrative Court had itself as an independent, impartial court expressed its doubts as to the decision taken by the tax authorities. So the Court of Justice rules close to what the referring court, the Latvian court, had submitted by way of a reference for a preliminary ruling expressing the doubts as to the correct classification of these goods 
in the common custom staff. The court added that the devices might fall under other headings of the combined nomenclature, which would not lead to 0% tax, but not either to 14% tax, but to a tax rate somewhere in between those two extreme numbers. A second example is a far more crucial example, which led to a landmark Grand Chamber judgment under the name Petruhi, a case involving protection against extradition to a non-member state. That case was referred by the Supreme Court of Latvia to our court. And it is now a case which is referred to by its name Petruhin, the Petruhin principle, like we still refer to Van Genten laws or Costa NL when we speak respectively about the direct effect or the primacy of union law. We now speak about the, pre the Petruhin principle and it's entirely the credit of the Supreme Court of Latvia to have submitted that court, you will see, to have found the initial interpretation of union law leading to doubts and therefore triggering the obligation by the Supreme Court of Latvia to uh, seize our court, which the Supreme Court of Latvia did, thus contributing heavily to that um, landmark judgment of our court. Mr. Petruhin is an Estonian national arrested in Latvia in order to be extradited to Russia, where he was to be prosecuted for drug trafficking. Petruhin objected to his extradition on the ground that as an EU citizen, an Estonian national finding himself lawfully in Latvia, he should enjoy the same protection against extradition as Latvian nationals. Indeed, as you know far better than I do, Latvian law prohibits, in principle, the extradition of Latvian nationals, and in accordance with the treaty concluded with Russia, Latvia does not extradite its own nationals to that country. So Mr. Petruhin says, I'm an Estonian living in Latvia. I should be treated equally with Latvian nationals in the relation with Russia. That raised an equal treatment issue, which the Supreme Court of Latvia as such submitted to the Court of Justice of the European Union. Sitting in its most solemn uh, composition, the Grand Chamber, 15 judges, the Court of Justice ruled on the 6th of September 2016 that a member state is not required to grant every Union citizen who has moved within its territory the same protection against extradition as that granted to its own nationals. The reason is that when a member state like Latvia is not extraditing its own nationals to a third state, that is normally because it has jurisdiction to prosecute its own national before its own courts. It's a matter of international criminal jurisdiction. A member state is not necessarily habilitated, competent under international criminal law standards to prosecute the nationals of another member state. And that is why, in principle, the unequal treatment between a member state's own nationals and the nationals of another member state when it comes to extraditing that person caught on the national territory to a third country is in principle acceptable. However, the court added, and that is the real new principle which we now call the Petruhin principle, the court said union citizenship of this Estonian national finding himself lawfully in Latvia under union law means that before extraditing this union citizen, in this case the Estonian national, 
the member state concerned, in this case Latvia, must give priority to the exchange of information with the member state of origin of the Union National, in this case Estonia, and allow that member state, Estonia, to request the citizens surrender for the purposes of prosecution. In other words, Estonia must be able to issue a European arrest warrant, bringing its national back to Estonia. Estonia has the same rule as Latvia, not extraditing to Russia its own nationals, and therefore Estonia could possibly prosecute Mr. Petruhin, just as Latvia could prosecute its own nationals when it is refusing to extradite them. That is really the ruling. The Grand Chamber found in essence that the difference in treatment and the restriction on the freedom of movement resulting therefrom can be justified by the legitimate aim to avoid that the person concerned remains unpunished. You feel it in what I have said so far. The concern is that the refusal of extradition be in principle compensated by the prosecution by the member state requested to extradite. For the Latinist among you, it is out dedere, out judicare. Either you extradite or you prosecute yourself. But to prosecute yourself, you have to have jurisdiction to do so. A member state always has vis-a-vis -vis its own nationals, not vis-a-vis -vis the nationals of another member state, albeit that they are union citizens. In that case, the other member state must be requested, do you want to issue a European arrest warrant and possibly prosecute yourself? If they say yes, the person will be surrendered to the other member state and not extradited. If they say no, we are not interested, the person may be extradited. That is really the Petru in principle, a crucially important case. The third example of a landmark reference for preliminary rulings, ruling, which is um, a reference for a preliminary ruling this time of the Constitutional Court of Latvia. Latvia is one of the very happy examples where the Constitutional Court has several times referred. Latvia is one of the front runners in that respect just like the Austrian Constitutional Court, the Belgian Constitutional Court, and to a lesser extent, many others, the Italian, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the, uh, the French, and so on. So that is to be absolutely uh, stressed and uh, very much welcomed, because I spoke to you already over the need to find the constitutional traditions common to the member states. It is frankly impossible to know these constitutional traditions where the constitutional courts themselves do not refer matters to our court and explain on that occasion the requirements of their national constitutions. The case concerns um, data protection and privacy protection as regards penalty points for road traffic offenses. The judgment dates, our judgment dates of 22nd of June 2021. So a driver on whom penalty points were imposed for having committed road traffic offenses challenged before the Latvian Constitutional Court that such information is publicly accessible. In fact, under the Latvian uh, law on motoring, any interested person may receive such information entered in the National Vehicle Register either directly from the competent authority or even from commercial service providers which reuse it. The objective of this transparency is to deter drivers from committing offenses and thus to improve road safety. The Latvian Constitutional Court, wholly correctly, considered that it must not only interpret the Constitution, but that it can only do so in line with Union law, Union law being binding for Latvia, in this case, namely, the General Data Protection Regulation and the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. Therefore, 
the Constitutional Court referred to the Court of Justice of the European Union. In its judgment, very recently as I said, the Grand Chamber of the Court, again our biggest bench, said that the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, precludes the Latvian legislation. And the reason was that it had not been established that disclosure of the personal data relating to the penalty points imposed for road traffic offences was really necessary because, of course, the objective of limiting the um, breaches of the um, traffic rules was absolutely legitimate, especially the breaches of the traffic rules which can endanger the life of other people. So road traffic offences are a very big problem and therefore for the heaviest um, offences it's absolutely normal that our court notes that there be a system of penalty points. However, the true incentive to comply with the traffic rules and not to commit those offences lies in the system of the penalty points which may lead to the actual withdrawal of the driver's license when sufficient points have been accumulated. The additional effectiveness of um, making these data uh, on these road uh, traffic offences public uh, was not proportionate with the objective. So in other words, it could not really be shown that there was a big additional gain in terms of efficiency of combating road traffic offences, and especially the heaviest one of those, ones of those, um, in relation to what was already gained by the system of the penalty points leading, um, in last instance, to the withdrawal of, of the driver's license, which was already uh, sufficiently effective in order to reach the legitimate aim of combating the, the road uh, traffic uh, offences. A pending case, of which I cannot not say a lot, that is, but it's a very important case. The opinion of Advocate General Cockot is out on the, 9th, uh, the 29th of April 2021. Um, the concerns the immunity of the former governor of the Central Bank of Latvia. Um, the Riga District Court opened criminal proceedings against the former governor of the Central Bank of Latvia for taking bribes and, and for money laundering in connection with the prudent, prudential supervision procedure concerning the Latvian bank Trasta Commerzbanka. But the district court had doubts as to the applicability and the scope of the immunities under the protocol on the privileges and immunities of the EU because a governor of a central bank of a eurozone member state, and as you all know, Latvia is fortunately enough a eurozone member state, the governor is part, is a member of the governing council of the European Central Bank and of the European Central Bank system. So there the question arose, does he enjoy in that capacity some immunities and what type of criminal investigation can be um, conducted um, without lifting the immunity or only after lifting the immunity? It is this issue which is presently pending, needless to say, again before the Grand Chamber. So you see, I have here three examples of Grand Chamber cases, one referred by the Supreme Court of Latvia one by the Constitutional Court of Latvia, but one by a Riga District Court, which is a lower instance court, but it's an equally important reference, and it also goes to the ground chamber of our court. So it is very important to see that, that we um, try to make um, the best use of the order for reference, it's the quality of the order for reference, which makes that is pan-European debate which potentially involves all 27 member states can take place, they all uh, express their positions in writing and orally on the reference and the content of the reference made and that way union law develops with the input 
of national courts and of all the member states participating in that uh, procedure. Of the 102 Latvian quote-unquote cases, actually 25, which is one quarter, are actually pending. And I stress this point because it means that there is a clear acceleration in numbers, but also in importance of the issues of union law, which are discovered by Latvian courts in their daily practice of making union law work as part of the Latvian legal system. These cases come up to our court and they really are dealt with with all the due um, attention and uh, diligence which uh, these cases uh, deserve. I spoke already several times of all member states being allowed to make uh, written and oral observations in um, preliminary uh, ruling procedures pending in our court. I give you a rapid overview of the most important cases where the Latvian government drawing from the constitutional traditions of Latvia, drawing from the legal system of Latvia, and from other sensitivities, also socially, culturally, ethically, made absolutely crucial contributions to uh, the debate taking place at the pan-European level before mostly the Grand Chamber of our court, and had a real input on the final outcome of our decision-making in these cases. Judge for yourself. The judgment of the 6th of October 2020 in the cases Quadrature du Net, Privacy International, it are the cases on the obligation for um, operators of electronic communications to retain the traffic data and the localization data of electronic communications. In these cases, we had to balance privacy against security. A typical balancing exercise, like the constitutional courts and the Supreme Court fulfilling the same uh, function, in all our 27 member states are operating. The Latvian government explained its views on striking the appropriate balance which was very much articulated around the operalizations, that's a difficult word to say, the making operational the principle, of, the principle of proportionality. And effectively, in our judgment, we uh, expressed that the gravity of the interference with the rights to privacy and the right to personal data protection should be weighed up against the importance of the objective of general interest being pursued by that grave interference with the right to privacy. For instance, if you are to retain in advance, in a generalized and indiscriminate way, all the data of all the users of electronic communications, that is a very strong interference with the fundamental right to privacy and the fundamental right to personal data protection, it can only be justified by the most severe threats resting on national security, including the fight against terrorism. When it comes to combating criminality, you can still retain data but it must already be more limited, more targeted, more precise, because criminality, especially grave criminality, think about homicide and so, or um, pedopornography, very grave forms of criminality, there of crime, there you can have important limitations on these rights, but not the gravest ones. So our judgment makes a whole balancing act for different types of uh, objectives of the general interest on the one hand, justifying the interferences with the fundamental rights concerns, articles 7 and 8 of the Charter, 
and balances them out. If the interference is very light, for instance, knowing the civil identity of a person behind the um, EMI number, that's a number of an electronic communications instrument, such as an, like an iPhone, um, then that's not a very severe interference because you can't really uh, profile the private life of a person by knowing who civil identity is behind a particular number, then the uh, pursuit, the prosecution better, of criminality in general, crime in general, might suffice to uh, justify such, um, um, such uh, retention of data and access to such data. So you see it's a very important judgment in which more than 15 member states intervened. Um, Latvia was one of them. Latvia also intervened um, in one of the Polish rule of law cases to defend the rule of law. Um, I'm referring here to a, a judgment uh, of the 19th of November of uh, 2019 of our court, the AK judgment, where um, the court had indeed to decide that the um, whether the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court of Poland, newly instituted, was indeed uh, an independent and an impartial court. As we all know, the court had unfortunately to rule that um, applying the standards of independence and impartiality of the courts, uh, there were some uh, doubts in that respect, but the final decision on it was to be made by the referring court, and the referring court was the Labour and Social Insurance Chamber of the uh, Polish uh, Supreme Court. In that case as well, Latvia intervened to defend the uh, requirements uh, inherent in respect for the rule of law, apply to courts, which means independence, impartiality of those courts, and the courts operating in accordance with the fair trial rules. It is basically the European Union equivalence uh, of equivalent of Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights, that is for us Article uh, 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. An important contribution by Latvia was also made in a five-judge chamber judgment of the 3rd of October 2019, which goes under the name Glavishnich Pieszek. Ms. Glavishnich Pieszek was a or is a member of the Austrian Parliament and the spokesperson for the Austrian Green Party. She sued Facebook Island in the Austrian courts seeking an order that Facebook Ireland remove a comment published by a user on the Facebook social network which was harmful to her reputation. And she also um, sought an, a prohibition uh, to further publish identical or equivalent content uh, on Facebook. The Austrian Supreme Court Oberse Gerichtshof, asked the Court of Justice to interpret the Directive on Electronic Commerce, under which a host provider such as Facebook is in principle not liable for stored information if it has no knowledge of its illegal nature or if it acts expeditiously to remove or to disable access to that information as soon as it becomes aware of it. That exemption does not, however, prevent the host provider from being ordered by a judge to terminate or prevent an infringement, including by removing the illegal information or by disabling access to it. However, and for reasons which you understand quite well, the directive prohibits any requirement for the host provider to monitor generally information which it stores or to seek actively facts or circumstances indicating illegal activity. The reason for that is quite simple. If you were to say to the host provider that it has to supervise everything and that if he doesn't do so, he risks being held liable for all the illegal content, like here defamatory content, 
that would lead to general surveillance ex ante, and then we're not far removed from censorship and an unacceptable limitation of the freedom of expression. So that is why the third chamber of our court, after observations to that effect also of the Latvian government, said no general supervision by the host provider, that's clear, no surveillance, but if the host provider gets specific notice of illegal content, then the host provider has the obligation to immediately take down. That's the system known as notice and take down. And then union law does not prevent the national courts, because union law simply has not regulated the matter, to order the host provider to take down, not just in Austria, in Ireland, in the European Union, but even worldwide, because the internet is everywhere and nowhere. Therefore, once it's on the internet, it can be accessed. So that's a very important case. A further example, which you probably know, it's a very delicate example, is the Coleman case, a Grand Chamber judgment of the 5th of June 2018. Mr. Coleman is a Romanian national who lives in Belgium where also he works as a migrant worker and he lives together with a man, Mr. Hamilton, who is US national. In Belgium, they marry. Belgium is one of the 13 member states having introduced as a family law competence, which is entirely national competence, same-sex marriage. After having worked for a whole number of years in Belgium, Mr. Coleman gets a new job opportunity in his member state of origin, Romania. When he comes home, the Romanian authorities refuse to give a long-term residence permit to Mr. Hamilton, saying that he is no family member of Mr. Coleman and therefore cannot obtain a long-term residence, long residence uh, permit in Romania. Mr. Coleman and Mr. Hamilton attack this administrative decision, refusing the grant of a long-term residence permit, and they lose at all stages, saying, the court saying, same-sex marriage is not recognized in Romania. But there is a last, a final appeal to the Romanian Constitutional Court. And again, an example of a Constitutional Court referring the matter to the Court of Justice of the European Union. The Romanian Constitutional Court, in a remarkable judgment, and I say this entirely positively, they say, well, as a matter of civil law, family law in Romania, we cannot recognize this marriage. However, they say, in the Constitution of Romania, the primacy of union law over Romanian law is being recognized. Marriage defined as a heterosexual marriage between a woman and a man is defined in the civil code in Romania and therefore, if on the basis of European Union law, Mr. Hamilton is to be recognized as the spouse of Mr. Coleman, we will have to set aside all the court judgments below ruling against Mr. Coleman and Mr. Hamilton, because then he is entitled to get the residence permit. Our court replied, and it shows how subtle we proceed, in how subtle a manner, basically, we proceed. Having heard all the member states intervening, there were, again, a, a great num a big number of them, including Latvia, availing themselves of the identity of the state. And we said, well, that is true. Every member state 
has the competence to decide for itself what marriage means. So Romania is not obliged to recognize as a family law matter this marriage. Also as a matter of inheritance law, the law of successions, inheritance law. Or for other purposes. But for the purpose of continuing the family life as a practical matter, which was built in one member state in lawful circumstances, according to the law of that member state, because of course each member state is competent to make its own family law uh, choices, so Belgium, Latvia, Poland, Portugal, Greece, they all have an equal right to make their own choices, as divergent these choices are among themselves, right? But we said, once a person has the family life in accordance with the law of the member state, where they resided as union citizens, being in the situation, in this case, um, of a migrant worker, then this union law status of being a migrant worker coming home requires, as a minimum, that the person accompanying this person as a spouse, quote-unquote, that is the term used in the Directive 2004, stroke 38, that person must be able to accompany the union citizen coming home. So we said, as a family law matter, there is no recognition of the uh, marriage due. As a free movement matter, the Romanian authorities must recognize Mr. Hamilton as the spouse for granting a long-term residence permit. Because indeed it is vested case law of the Court of Justice that free movement means that no obstacles may be put to leave a member state, to go to another member state, but there may, no be, there may, no, there may not be obstacles put either upon returning from a member state to your member state of origin, to inter alia, the family life which you developed in another member state while you were, on the basis of union law, a resident in that other member state. Because indeed, if you know that the family law which you develop in the other member state will be abruptly interrupted upon return to the member state of origin, uh, quite frankly, there is no much free movement left. So you see, we combined the requirements of full free movement in all directions with at the same time full respect for the member states to make their own choices. So Mr. Coman got his residence permit. The Constitutional Court followed, without any difficulty, our judgment. The decisions refusing the residence permit were annulled, and that was the only thing which was done. So that is a way of combining national identity of member states with the requirements of free movement. It can be done. The Court of Justice of the European Union does not say to member states what they should do in terms of their choices of family law. That's national identity, which deserves full respect by our court. But the common rules govern free movement. And there, all uh, avoidable obstacles must be done away with. It's this combination which we made in the Coleman judgment. There are a few further examples of, um, uh, of cases in which uh, Latvia um, has intervened as a member state. The Rotman judgment on um, uh, nationality and on losing nationality with an impact on the lo possible loss of um, European uh, Union citizenship. Um, there are, of course, the somewhat older cases now, but very important, the Viking Line and Laval cases. And uh, I'll give you the Laval case because that is a case which directly involves uh, Latvia. Um, in the Laval case, 
you have a La Laval, Laval und Partneri, a Latvian company, which posted workers from Latvia to work on building sites in Sweden. The work was carried out by a subsidiary, Baltic Big, and included the renovation and extension of school premises in the town, Swedish town of Vaxholm. The Swedish Building and Public Works Trade Union started negotiations with Laval and Baltic Big with a view to determining the rates of pay for the posted workers and to Laval signing the collective agreement for the building sector. That is the Swedish collective agreement for the building sector. Those negotiations failed. Therefore, Laval signed collective agreements in Latvia with the Latvian Building Sector Trade Union. In response, the Swedish Trade Union began collective action in the form of a blockade of all Laval sites in Sweden. This led in turn Baltic Big and indirectly Latvia um, to cease activities in Sweden and all the posted workers returned to Latvia. You feel this case was, I've been sitting in the, that case, December 2007, was extremely sensitive because in a way it was an opposition between Swedish workers and Latvian workers. The Latvian workers, in order to get work, being very happy to be posted in Sweden under Latvian labor law conditions, whereas the Swedish workers said through their trade union, but that is harming our interests because either we will be, be paid less like the Latvian workers or else we will lose our work in favor of the Latvian workers. So this is relatively short after the accession of Latvia, the difference in salaries were still relatively big, they are fortunately less big today, but they were bigger then. And so Laval brought proceedings before the Swedish labor court in order to um, preclude the trade unions to conduct this type of collective actions against Laval's interests in Sweden. The Swedish labor court referred the matter to us. Needless to say, the Kingdom of Sweden and the Republic of Latvia came in on totally opposite sides. It's a beautiful example of where member states have widely divergent interests and they come in our court and a whole range of other member states come in either on one side or on the other side, which was also the case here. In its judgment of the 20 of uh, 18 December 2007, the Grand Chamber of the Court found that the collective action in the form of a blockade of sites constituted a restriction of the freedom to provide services, which in this case was not justified. These were posted workers. It was not justified to require that they be subject to the Swedish rules on um, social security and on um, uh, labor conditions. So in this case, the court ruled in the sense advocated by Latvia. Well, a few more practical aspects. Um, I would also draw your attention to the fact that the court is not only 27 judges, it also has an, a system of advocates general. And this is quite remarkable. The system of advocates general comes in fact from French law. It exists in all uh, French Supreme Courts where there is a member of the court who makes in her or his own right a personal contribution to the solution of the case but it is not binding. It is a very important opinion, but it is a starting point for the process of deliberation uh, between uh, the judges making part of the 
a bench deciding the case. And that is either 15 judges for the most important cases, five judges or three judges. Now, for the easiest cases. There are 11 advocates general. Why 11? You don't need 27, because the advocate general is always sitting all by her or himself in a case, whereas the judges are always sitting in colleges. So you need more judges uh, sitting in cases than you need the advocate general. They divide all the cases needing an opinion of the advocate general as a starting point for the collegiate deliberation of the bench deciding the case, you need only one advocate general. So 11 is enough. These 11 advocate generals, since the beginning, are divided over the member states in the following way. You have the biggest member states, they used to be six, after Brexit there are five left, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and Poland. They have permanently a post of advocate general. The 22nd, the 22nd, uh, 22 better, uh, other member states, they have a rotational post of advocate general, meaning that they take turns in accordance with an alphabetical order in their mother tongue, in their national official language, they take turns for a post of advocate general six years and then the post goes to a next member state. I'm glad to tell you that we all are looking forward to welcoming the first Latvian Advocate General for the first time ever uh, since Latvia's accession next 7th of October. So that is of course a big moment where a Latvian Advocate General will take the place of the Danish Advocate General who was there for the six previous years. So that is the system of Advocate Generals. The Advocate General play a very important role because they brush a somewhat broader picture of each case coming to the court. For instance, again, um, looking deeply into claims to national identity or finding the constitutional traditions common to the member states. Analyzing the case law of national constitutional and supreme courts in particular fields of the law, such as data protection, but also marriage, family law, adoption, all subjects which are not necessarily, some are, like data protection, but others, family law, are not subjects of union law proper but which the court needs to be aware of in order to make, for instance, free movement work or in order to make non-discrimination directives work, etc. So the advocates general are important uh, sources of comparative law research in their work and in their opinions. That is the reason why the opinion of the advocates general is always translated into the 24 official languages of the Union. Because the judgment of the court, that's the only binding decision, also translated into 24 languages, needs to be read against the background of the opinion, which can come to the same outcome or to the different outcome. That's not so important. But the outside reader of our case law knows that the judgment was deliberated against the backdrop of an opinion which was already available in the public domain on the internet before the judges sitting in the bench of the court started their deliberations. So the authority of the court and the legitimacy of the court is greatly enhanced by reading the judgment as the collegiate outcome of sometimes painstaking deliberations with really a view to uh, reaching the highest quality possible in the grounds of judgment, together with the opinion of the Advocate General, to fully seize the importance of a case. We have also an important research department which helps us in finding 
the, um, in finding the law, starting from the comparative law sources of our own member states. Besides that, and I say this especially because many judges are taking part in the um, summer school of, of the Riga uh, Law School, uh, we also have the more informal channels of uh, cooperation and mutual understanding um, be between the um, courts uh, in the European Union. That is, the national courts as courts of general jurisdiction and the Court of Justice of the European Union responsible for the uniform interpretation. Five years ago, we <coughs> established the judicial network of the European Union. On the judicial network of the European Union, which you find on the home page on the internet of the Court of Justice of the European Union itself, when you come on the home page, you can immediately make the binary choice to enter either in the court's website or to enter alternatively in the website of the judicial network of the European Union. There you find in all 24 languages uh, all the preliminary ruling procedures, the past ones, the decisions, the follow-up decisions of the national courts, you can find them there, the um, uh, research notes which the Court of Justice has been um, uh, ordering from its own research department and the comparative law analysis which these notes contain, all of that you find on that website. Not in 24 languages, but all the same. You find it in English and in French. Um, the follow-up judgments of preliminary rulings, you find them in the language of the judgment, but sometimes also with translations added when it are important uh, judgments. So that is an absolutely important uh, element. Besides the preliminary reference procedure, I of course mentioned pro memori, also infringement actions. Uh, there has been uh, so far only uh, one infringement action against Latvia, and I would absolutely congratulate Latvia that there has only been one infringement action uh, in 17 years. Um, to say it somewhat playfully, I cannot say the same for many of the founding member states, including my own, the Kingdom of Belgium, uh, which have uh, far bigger incidents of um, infringement actions. The one there was, uh, was, uh, um, well, as you probably all know, on the, uh, on the Latvian law, on the notarial profession, uh, which of 1993, that is long before the um, accession, it had never been adapted, it provided that only nationals of the Republic of Latvia may be notaries, you should know that in 2011, the court had, vis-à-vis uh, -vis a whole range of member states, France, Belgium, in fact, all the member states which have the system of the notaria latin, uh, the court had there held that the nationality requirement could not be upheld. However, requirement of particular training and, and um, internships, etc., and an examination in some member states, all of that could be required but not the nationality as such. To conclude, I think that despite all possible deficiencies and fallbacks, the common project, that is the project of creating a common legal space for 27 member states linked to one another with open borders on a single continent. It is an undeniable success story. But it is, of course, work in progress. The current challenges, such as globalization, digitalization, migration, and environment, obviously need a common European Union approach to make our common continent work up to standards of the time. Standards of good governance, standards of rule of law. But that being said, unity is not a goal in itself. Unity is only a way to express 
what the principle of subsidiarity entails. That is, to do together what only meaningfully and effectively can be done better together. Security, external security, aspects of internal security in a space with open borders, judicial cooperation in civil matters, in criminal matters, then we simply must go about it together. That's the aspect of unity. The common currency, the internal market, the care for clean air, clean water, sustainable energy supply, all of that is unity. But the union is united in diversity. And the diversity is just as important as the unity. I said several times during this guest lecture that we work in 24 languages. Discord is an expression of that diversity. We are a citizen's court. The cases we deal with here are relevant for consumers, for patients getting better medical care, like the case which we had from Latvia. I'll try to say it in Latvian. Veselibas Ministria. The hospital treatment and the freedom of religion case, where a small child was a patient, but the child stemmed from parents being Jehovah's Witnesses. The child needed to be cared for through an operation. The operation in Latvia was perfectly possible but only using a blood transfusion. That was not consistent with the religious beliefs of the parents. In Poland, an almost neighboring state, indirectly neighboring state, the same operation could be done without blood, blood transfusion. So the parents go there, have the child operated on, and afterwards ask the reimbursement to the Latvian um, social security. The Latvian court asks us whether European Union law rules on the reimbursement of medical costs for patients getting medical care in another member state than their own, that is their own in this case being the member state of affiliation to the social security system, whether these medical costs had to be reimbursed in a situation where the reason why they went to the other member state was not that there was insufficient medical care locally, but was a matter of religion. It's a very technical judgment involving the coordination of the social security systems of the member states, that is regulation 883 stroke 2004, and on the other hand, the free movement of patients directive of 2011. We said under the latter directive that Latvia was to pay, but at the rate of the Latvian rules, not at the rate of the Polish rules. Because in the coordination of social security systems, the rate used is the rate of the member state where the medical care is actually provided. That would here be Poland. And that costed a lot more. So we said, if the person could be operated, in this case the child, in Latvia at a given cost, Latvia had not to bear this cost, they can pay out the same amount of what it would have costed to the parents, but not more. I use this to tell you we are a citizen's court. We speak about patients, about retired people, about students, about workers, about artists, about all people who are in daily life confronted to aspects of European Union law in all the subject matters for which the member states have empowered the European Union 
to make common rules. That is basically what we do. We make these rules work to the extent they are meant to work, but not beyond that. Think again about the Coman case. Free movement had to work, but the right of each member state to fill out its own choices in sensitive family law related matters expressing national identity is also as a matter of European Union law worthy of the fullest respect. That's how our court works. It is an expression of the court's motto, of the union's motto, excuse me, united in diversity. With all that, I wish you an exciting summer school and all the best.